everyone. Welcome back. First of all, I would like to thank you for the huge attendance of the Slide to Open Shipping Finance 2021 conference. By now, we have reached the number of 8,000 unique attendees and the number is still growing. Today, we are hosting a post-event, a legal roundtable put up and moderated by its All About Shipping channel and Ms. Gina Panagiotti. Gina is a maritime lawyer, CVO and founder of Oceans Arena, and the concept founder of It's All About Shipping. She's going to discuss with expert maritime lawyers from all around the world the givens and the non-givens of the ever given. So stay tuned as we try to assemble the puzzle and please send us your questions. They will be answered by our speakers live. Thank you for joining us. So hi everybody and welcome to It's All About Shipping. I'm Gina Panayotu, uh, the host of this broadcast and I'm very happy today to be hosting the second global legal roundtable, uh, bringing some great legal minds and friends and colleagues from around the globe to discuss uh, interesting legal topics. And today's uh, topic is definitely one that has been keeping the shipping industry quite occupied for the past month. We will be discussing um, the ever given incident, so the givens and non givens of uh, ever given, putting it in legal in a legal perspective. And I've brought together uh, lawyers from distinguished lawyers from various jurisdictions and backgrounds and experiences, so we can have a very diverse and interesting discussion on what are the legal implications of this um, incident that has been making uh, the news. So to introduce my amazing panel, I've got uh, with me today uh, Nicholas Wu, who is based in the UK and also Singapore qualified and is a partner at Big Birkert, shipping, uh, managing the shipping and international trade team, of course. Uh, Lena Chasutien, who is uh, based in Geneva and also in Hamburg, who is the managing director and founder of Recupex. Uh, Lorenzo Macchi, who is based in, has offices in Rome, London and Izmir and is the founding partner and head of shipping at Meplo. Harry Krishna, who is based in Dubai, the CEO of Nimbo Legal. Uh, Konstantin Krasko Kutsky, I always have a difficulty with your surname, Konstantin, uh, who is based in Russia, managing partner of Navicus.law. Uh, Christopher B. Kender, who is based in New York and is a maritime lawyer, a proctor in admittory and adjunct professor of maritime law at the Brooklyn Law School. And of course, Mark Lucking, uh, who has been made partner yesterday. Congratulations, Mark, again, at Stephenson Harwood Middle East, uh, of course, in the marine and international uh, trade uh, department. Department. Thank you very much, guys, for being on this panel today. Uh, thank you to the audience for joining. And just, of course, to make a brief introduction, if uh, people are not aware of the incident. So uh, the Ever Given was a, a, one of the very great container ships who was, um, who was grounded in the Suez Canal. Uh, it's 400... Um, sorry, let me get the figures here around. So there were... Yes. 400 meters long, sorry. Uh, its width is 59 meters, 190 feet full, 240 uh, ton, um, thousand tons, and it has a capacity of 20,000 approximately containers. So when it blocked the canal, it was quite a crisis for the shipping industry. Uh, they managed to refloat it after six days. And actually today is quite um, an interesting day to be having this panel because yesterday was announced that the Swiss Canals Authority have made a claim for uh, 916 billion, um, yes, million, sorry, almost a billion, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So without further ado, I would like to start this conversation with some thoughts and takes on the different perspectives. We have numerous stakeholders, so from ship owners, charterers, cargo holders, insurance, uh, there's canal authorities, of course, and um, different aspects, different legal aspects which arrive, arise, which I would all like you to share based on Gina, your background. Gina, Gina, I should add that not only was a claim made, but the ship was arrested. Yes, of course. Means that it's blocked and that the crew is stuck on the vessel Thank and you. that it can't move because it was, there was a maritime arrestment claim. So they have, a, they have recourse against the vessel itself. If it's not paid, they can force the sale. And of course, who knows, how long that's going to take. 
Exactly. Thank you for clarifying, actually, Christopher. Yes, there's 25 crew members on board which have been held captive in a way. The vessel has been arrested. And actually, another interesting fact is that part of this claim, the 300 million, are for reputational damage. So that would also give an interesting uh, aspect to this discussion today. And another issue, of course, that we would like to, uh, which came uh, to the light of the media last Thursday, if I'm not mistaken, was also the uh, application, the limitation application that was filed in the London High Court. So um, I guess, uh, uh, Constantin, if you would like to go first, and we'll make the round of the table and um, take this discussion forward. Sure, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me and hosting uh, this round table. Uh, yeah, there are a number of, point, of points that uh, would be interesting to discuss. Uh, firstly would be uh, the limitation. And as far as I'm aware, uh, an application for setting up a limitation fund has already been filed to the High Court in, the, in London. And I've checked before the round table, I actually calculated, if I'm not uh, mistaken, the uh, limitation is around uh, 116 million uh, US dollars, which is much, much less than uh, the claims filed by, uh, the, the claims announced by uh, the Egyptian authorities. But we must take into account that the um, Whilst Egypt is a party to the 1976 uh, Limitation Convention, uh, the claims that are excluded from limitation are salvage and general average claims. So uh, the, uh, the, the, the major part of the claim of the Suez Canal Authority is uh, uh, salvage and reputational damage, uh, whatever that is, uh, that would be probably subject to Egyptian law. But as far, uh, as, far as other claims are concerned, there will be a, a, a maximum limit of 116, 115 uh, million US dollars. And then if we, if we talk about uh, claims from, coming from uh, the cargo owners, uh, I would, uh, I think that uh, the cargo owners wouldn't have any claims for for delay, uh, because if if we refer to to the Hague Visby rules, it's probably an error in navigation. Uh, so uh, and uh, and the rest that that won't won't allow the cargo to to claim for uh, damages for delay in uh, in, the sh in their shipments. I would, I, I, this is Christopher, I was wondering if, if, if any of the bills of lading involved COGS of the US statute, which would be a similar result in that error of navigation and management um, precludes liability by owners. And of course, there's a package limitation under COGSA, the, car, the Carriage of Goods by Sea Act, which is $500 per package, which would depend on how the cargo was, was packed um, some cases even say it's by container. So I would agree with you. I think the recourse of the, of the, of the ins assuming the insurers of the cargo will be subrogated to whatever losses occurred. I think the cargo claims are going to be uh, limited. At least they would be under COGSA and probably under most other schemes uh, as well, uh, at least to the package limitation, if not uh, to zero because it's an error of navigation and management. So I would agree with you on that. I don't know whether any other uh, members of the panel have a view on that, but I think the cargo interest, again, I'm sure the cargo is insured. So it's going to be the cargo insurers who are going to take the brunt of this, of this uh, expense uh, of this incident, at least in my view. Can we just oh, just do the round of the table with some general comments before we go into raising the questions and the discussions, just to give everybody a chance to give us a feel and background of what they've come across. Um, Constantin, is there something you wanted to add on that? Well, uh, uh, probably no, just the, the, the basic sam summary is the types of claim. And then I suggest we, we go through the, the limitation, go through limitation, uh, cargo claims, uh, salvage, general average, and discuss uh, some insurance issues thereafter. So uh, I give my word to, to the, the following speaker. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Um, um, Harry, would you like to share your initial thoughts on this before we go into raising questions and discussions? Sure. Thank you. Thanks for having me here. 
Um, uh, I've been here in the Middle East for nearly 15 years. And uh, yeah, whilst, uh, you know, I think uh, that, that there, there would be broad agreement that legally this isn't a complex case. It's just a very big ship in a very tight space. Uh, other than that, I mean, legally, there's there's nothing complicated about this from a from a maritime law perspective. Uh, however, from a regional perspective, yeah, this is a, a Middle Eastern court looking at you know an issue of great national importance. A large part of the national economy depends on that canal. Uh, a, a lot of People now know what the Suez Canal is, which is great uh, for, from a shipping industry perspective. But the fact that so many people were laughing about the incident uh, gave rise to a lot of uh, hurt feelings in Egypt. So a lot of what's happening right now from the Egyptian perspective is uh, from, from the perspective of having been insulted and offended. So reputational damage is a, is a mistranslation. Uh, the, the, the correct legal concept under uh, civil law in, in Egypt and, and in the UAE where I'm based is moral damages, which is basically uh, we were so hurt and offended by all of this, therefore we should be compensated. So, uh, so, so, so I, I think it's important to recognize where the Egyptians are coming from, that this was quite hurtful, um, you know, and... Uh, which is why we had some fairly emphatic pronunciations that you know it wasn't the weather there was uh, there was human error involved and and so on and so forth uh, because that again is based on you know a historical reluctance to uh, uphold limitation of liability you know uh, it, it, the, 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 there's a the, there's a nearly a cultural uh, uh, you know, uh, expectation that, you know, if something goes wrong, well, the ship owner is at fault. So uh, I'm not saying that's how this will end up being decided, but this is just two weeks in and the ship's still there, which again, I mean, even in a very small maritime incident, it's not unusual for a ship to be stuck there for two weeks without security being provided. So, uh, you know, the, the only reason this is so big is because it's a big ship, you know? So I, I, I think uh, that should inform our discussion here. Legally, this is not a very complex case uh, from a maritime law perspective. Uh, it's can just I, the can state- I, can, I, can yeah. I interrupt? I'm moral damage, I mean, again, I'm a US maritime lawyer and I don't want to dominate the conversation, but I, I've never heard of the concept of moral damages under maritime law. And in the US, we have a, as you probably know, we have what we call a bright line rule on economic loss in the absence of actual physical damage, which is a separate question. But I've never heard of the concept of moral damages under maritime law. So I'm wondering if that exists under, under, under other maritime schemes in other countries, because it's, it's news to me as a US maritime lawyer. It really wouldn't, it really wouldn't matter, would it? I mean, because as, as we were discussing just now, it is, the ship is in Egypt. Um, yeah. and, and as long as Egyptian law recognizes that there's a moral law damage. But uh, Hari, if you don't mind my asking, uh, so, so Constantine mentioned the, 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 the limitation action which was commenced in, in, in the English High Court. Do you think the Egyptian, bearing in mind that Egypt is, is, uh, is, a, is a signatory, do you think the Egyptian courts will uh, recognize any limitation uh, fund uh, 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 judged by an English high court? I, in, in principle, there's nothing stopping them from recognizing the limitation fund. Uh, yeah. But equally, I mean, from, uh, uh, you know, uh, whether they are prepared to do so in these yeah. circumstances, That's in this thing. case... Yes. A, it's too early to say, See, but yeah. B, I would I would expect quite a bit of reluctance. Yeah. Because yeah. you know, it, 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 uh, I mean, uh, we cannot forget the domestic audience. You know, there are, yeah. Yeah. you know, the, 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 there's a huge yeah, yeah. amount of emotional involvement in this for at a yeah, national yeah. level. Yeah, yeah. Um, but 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 coming to Christopher's point, I, it's uh, 
there is no bright line rule uh, in in Middle Eastern uh, you know civil law states. Uh, you know, unlike in the U.S., where you have a maritime common law, uh, there is no such thing here. It's it's the same set of legal principles. The maritime codes in all of these countries uh, are, you know, uh, fairly similar to maritime legislation around the world. They incorporate, you know, flavors of the Hague Bisbee regime and and various international conventions. Deal with marine insurance. Deal with limitation, etc. But the underlying uh, legal framework, uh, you know, still allows for, uh, you know, uh, uh, claims in, uh, in tort uh, and, and claims that are known as, uh, you know, claims for acts causing harm. So, uh, and, and that's where you have direct, indirect uh, losses and, and, you know, uh, and moral damages, uh, which, uh, which is what, the so-called reputational damage claim uh, appears to be. Um, so in terms of initial, think, initial thoughts, that's, that's it from my end. I, I think maybe just to chip in there as well. Um, I think what, what Krista was saying, I mean, maybe looking at it through the, the lens of a maritime lawyer, that the Egyptian authorities have arrested the vessel. I, my understanding isn't that actually that's what's happened. My understanding is that they've impounded it. So it's not like they're pursuing a traditional maritime claim against the vessel for these moral damages because as harry said the uh, countries over here dubai egypt they they have a maritime code and they have very defined um, sets of maritime claims but so so they're not bringing these reputational damages and these giant damages claims against the vessel on the basis they're a maritime claim they are as harry said they're bringing those claims in tort and my understanding with the vessel is they haven't arrested it they've impounded the vessel uh which presumably uh, has more of the kind of cr criminal criminal law flavor to it um for drugs like drugs trafficking or something along those lines rather than a, a traditional arrest of the vessel that, that we would tend to see Hmm. Uh, but just, just, just one more uh, point. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, the, the, the other thing to bear in mind is right now, a lot of this is aimed at the domestic uh, audience. But when it when eventually uh, the Swiss Canal Authority uh, has to deal with its international audience, its customer base, uh, by then we will see a more realistic commercial approach. Uh, and, I, and I think that will... That will eventually happen because you know it is a big source of revenue for the country and for the SEA, uh, but but it's still a bit too soon. Yeah, I think one of the I would also like to hear, of course, uh, Nick, if you wanted to add something, Lena and Lorenzo, who haven't spoken yet, uh, but their reputational or, or moral damages is actually one of the main things that I've been reading about over the past like since it, the, the arrest has been announced, because they're actually saying that there's no real legal base, it's not actually maritime, and there's no legal basis as to what reputation or damage has uh, happened, essentially. Uh, but yeah, Lorenzo, Lina, Nick, if you wanted to elaborate or any initial thoughts. Yes, yes I would like to uh, join discussion. Um, so first of all, I agree with Hari uh, that... Um, we deal here with a very specific geographical um, area. And uh, cargo claims, claims in tort, everything comes together. But we have to understand where exactly vessel owner and um, ever given uh, uh, vessel managers did mistake in negotiating uh, the entire deal from the outset with uh, uh, Suez Canal Authority. And um, uh, that's why uh, I really would like to stack on the uh, Hari thoughts that um, vessel arrest was as a backfire from Suez Canal Authority uh, due to lack of substantive and constructive negotiation from PNI Club and from the vessel side. Here, uh, uh, we have to admit that there were some mistakes done, um, uh, which uh, could uh, um, accelerate uh, the outcomes if um, it was a more proactive approach used. Uh, reputational damage is very uh, similar to environmental damages, right? Um, we, uh, being uh, abroad attorneys, we cannot uh, really assess or understand uh, the monetary value 
uh, from the Egyptian standpoint of view, where uh, Suez Canal uh, is um, super important for their economy. And um, they had a full right to do this and uh, lack from vessel owner to negotiate the deal brought uh, the vessel to the arrest or in Poundland. So here is the first thing. And the longer vessel and PNI club delay to put a LOU forward or to come up to settlement agreement, uh, the, the more amount increase. You know, because for um, local authorities, it's not that difficult legally, and all of us, we know, to substantiate and to support national importance claim. Because here it becomes, as well as country sovereignty uh, uh, claim, it's not only a, a salvage and cargo claim anymore. So um, we, we have to have this uh, economical impact in mind. So that's all from my side for to, for, uh, for a while. Yeah, that's a definitely very interesting perspective. And uh, Lorenzo, going on to hi. you. Yeah, hi, hi, Gina. Thank you very much for having me here. Uh, well, pretty much has been said uh, a lot. Um, I, I agree with Harry. Uh, what is real relevant is the is the fact that media. Uh, for the first time, uh, <laughs> realized that, that there is a shipping industry, and that they, they realized that uh, if something uh, happened in the chain of the shipping industry, then all the economy, the economy can can go down. So um, I think, however, that the, the, the these uh, particular cases is particularly complex. Uh, there are uh, yeah, the, the limitation funds, there is the issue related with the general average. Uh, there are the consequences that um, are on the uh, single country uh, claims in the, in the, in the port, in the port uh, container shortage um, or yeah, other complexity. And then another thing is uh, surely uh, all the other vessels involved in the uh, in, in the casualties, or let's say in, in the traffic jam. So uh, let's think that uh, there may be dispute arising out uh, uh, be between the ship owners and the charterers, and between uh, and under the contract in the international contract of sales, uh, which are from time to time regulated from a different uh, law. So um, the question is indeed complex. Um, and uh, another thing uh, re regarding the reputation, which is, yeah, is, is, is moral, uh, <laughs> is moral, but uh, at least in Italy, this is dealt uh, from case to case um, by the case law, by the judges. So is the concept of moral damage is shaped by, uh, by the case law, at least I'm talking about Italy, uh, rather than the, the civil code or the commercial code. If I, I think if I could just make one comment, we're lawyers and the trouble is we're dealing with two levels here. We're dealing with the political level and with the legal level. And I'm getting the sense, I was very appreciative of Harry's comments. I think the political level is overwhelming the legal level. So yeah. we can discuss the legal implications and the niceties of maritime law under our different countries. But I, I, I get the sense, and this was something I didn't realize until we've had this discussion today, the political level is probably going to overwhelm the legal level. So those are the two, the, those are the two problems or problems there. Those are the two realities that I think we're dealing with is the legal framework and the political framework. And my guess is the political framework is going to completely overwhelm the legal framework. That, that's just my sense from 10 minutes of conversation, which I very much appreciate. Indeed, actually, that's very a very valid comment, and I've been uh, seeing this uh, since the beginning. I would say that it's turning more into a political kind of uh, debate. But anyway, nevertheless, we are here as lawyers to discuss some of the legalities. And Christopher, actually, taking on from what Lorenzo was saying about the ves the rest of the vessels that were in a traffic jam, um, you have also written quite an extensive uh, article uh, under U.S. law, of course, on. Um, the different kind of uh, charter parties and the vessels in transit. So maybe you would like to chip in on that a little bit, and then I'll give the platform to Nick and Mark to elaborate with their initials. Well, 
again, again, as I as I mentioned, I think this is going to be more of an insurer issue than a cargo owner or ship owner issue. I think the P and I clubs and the cargo insurers are going to be the ones that are most effective. And as I think I mentioned in my article, U.S. has a bright line rule, which I'm sure everybody's heard of the Robbins Dry Dock case, that famous Supreme Court case from the 20s, where if you don't have physical damage, pure economic loss is not recoverable under U.S. law. There was another famous case called the Test Bank. It was a chemical pollution of the Mississippi, and it was closed. And all these businesses that didn't suffer actual physical injury, they weren't polluted, they weren't contaminated, but were required to close, were not allowed to recover under this maritime rule. The theory being, where do you draw the line? How far back do you go? Is the, is the travel agent in, in, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, who specializes in trips to the Mississippi and loses money because the Mississippi River is closed, gonna be able to recover on maritime law in the US? likes a, what we call a bright line. They wanna draw the, so under US law, and again, I have no idea what the rules are going to be under the scheme here. None of those vessels that were delayed are going to be able to recover under what we would call third party insurance. They would not be able to recover against the ship owner. Now they might have their own independent uh, uh, interruption or delay insurance which is first party insurance, which they might be able to get money for, but then those insurers would not have much of a right against the ship owner. So, it, it, and I agree to some degree, it's not that, I think general average is complicated and I don't understand it myself completely, but I think from a general perspective of liabilities under US law, um, the, the vessels that were delayed and blocked and the traffic jam, they would have no recourse other than against their insurers if they have delay cover uh, and then those insurers would be subrogated, would probably would not be able to recover against the uh, against the ship owner. Now, I had one other theory, which again in Egypt probably would never work. Was the is there an issue of design of the canal? Because at that point where this vessel was blocked, uh, it wasn't a four lane highway; it was a two lane highway, and maybe it should have been a four lane highway, and it should have been foreseeable that this could happen, and that therefore. Uh, the canal has some responsibility for not having properly maintained or designed. But I think in Egypt, that's a not, I would say in the U S that's probably a non-starter. And now I, yeah, I, 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 thank, I, I, you for, I, thank you for sorry. asking the question. <laughs> yes. So, so sorry to interrupt, but I think the short answer is there's nothing wrong with the canal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's definitely, you know, an interesting way of uh, putting that. And uh, since you mentioned with the general average, it's something to be honest that I, I, I also haven't quite understood. And Nick was uh, kind enough to be explaining it to me in, uh, the other day when we were having a discussion. So maybe you would like to add on on that and any general thoughts. And I would also like to hear from Mark, uh, of course. Yeah, maybe we skip the general average thing to slightly later. I, there's just two points I wanted to raise, both quite separate. Um, the first is bear in mind the numbers involved. Um, limitation is 110,000. The value of the vessel is 100,000. The claim is over 900, sorry, million. Uh, 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 um, what I'm basically saying is that, um, and also don't forget the insurance. Yeah? Um, uh, the club's uh, uh, pool uh, reinsurance only goes up to 10 mil. Anything above that has to be reinsured. At 900 million, even if they cut it by half, it's still 450 million, way above, way above uh, any figures and would do untold damage, frankly, in the marine insurance industry. Um, if the canal was serious, um, and we were talking about this earlier before the, 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 the streaming started, if the canal was serious, because the ultimate group owner, Sean Kaon, owns over 50 vessels. And unfortunately, they have gone on the record saying we own the vessel. So uh, I've looked at uh, Sean Kaon's uh, uh, shipping list and they own a huge number of box ships, large box ships as well all of which presumably, or some of which presumably, will have to pass through the Suez Canal. Yeah, Unless, of course, they decide to go around the Cape in the future. So you have that one dark picture. 
just to sort of paint. And the other is, is actually uh, uh, um, non-legal. Uh, 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 Gina, you mentioned 27 crew held captive, and that's a very emotional word. Uh, 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 the crews, crews being stuck on ships while they're under arrest is nothing new. Uh, I wouldn't call them being held captive. However, the tragedy has been really um, what's been happening to our ships, to our crews in the last year. And I read an editorial uh, rightly um, lamenting that the industry didn't use this opportunity when the world's media was on shipping, as Hari said, um, to talk about the plight of ship's crews because of the pandemic, because they have been, you know, the poor chaps have not been able to disembark, have not been able to trans because of individual countries' policies. And uh, uh, Mark O'Neill, who's an old friend of mine, uh, who was in, at, at the Intermanager Conference, was lamenting that IMO couldn't do anything. It was completely hopeless. Uh, with respect <laughs> to IMO. This is Mark O'Neill's words, not mine. Uh, uh, but the point of it is that uh, it's, it's, it's an opportunity wasted in, in the shipping industry for not, not bringing the world's attention um, to the plight of ships' crews worldwide, not the ship. This ship, I, I suspect, you know, they, they should be okay. Uh, they're not in, you know, you know, and, and of course the, the Japanese owners and, and 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 Taiwanese are you know well known for looking after people when they can. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't say they're captive, but that, those were the only two points I wanted to raise at I the moment. Actually, yeah, I actually I agree with you. I just use the word because of this extra sensitivity with the crew uh, change crisis, obviously, and the emphasis that should be given to crew. So in that context, it does take on a wide, a, a deeper. Uh, uh, meaning, I would say. Um, nevertheless, the ICS has tried. I mean, I have seen the statements by Guy, Guy Platen. He has tried to emphasize in every press release in respect to the Suez Canal, uh, the situation with the crew crisis in general. But I think it's just something that unfortunately the media doesn't find so interesting. It's much more interesting to say huge ship blocks canal than uh, uh, <laughs> the crisis with the crew. Um, Mark, uh, some, uh, some thoughts from your side also before we do the rounds again? Uh, yeah, so I think one thing maybe we haven't touched on much is um, the impact on the uh, the chain of ships either side of the canal. Uh, um, certainly the one thing uh, that I saw a lot of uh, a few weeks ago was on the sail contract side, which isn't strictly on the shipping side. But that was impacted very, very heavily because as opposed to your standard cargo claims where people, they can take time and uh, like I said, there's the insurance issues on the sail contract side, there was a, a massive impact because you have very tight deadlines for delivery, lay cams for vessels going to pick up cargo. Um, so a couple of the big issues I dealt with there, which will lead to ongoing issue, ongoing litigation, is, is on that side of things, and that had an immediate impact. And one, one interesting thing uh, we saw there, um, both under the sale contracts, under the charter parties, is whether you could invoke the force majeure clauses, uh, which is something I'd imagine we'll spend a bit of time talking about today. Uh, and certainly uh, uh, there was a lot of lively debate, uh, which was thankfully curtailed by how quickly the, the vessel was removed in the end uh, but uh, I'd imagine if it had been there for five or six weeks you'd have had a lot of cases going to court where the question of whether or not uh, it was right to have waited outside the canal for the vessel to be removed or whether the vessel should have started to go around the Cape of Good Hope uh, and whether or not the voyages all of these vessels were fixed on and the sale contracts uh, for which the goods were uh, sold were, was actually impossible to perform um, because if you look at a map, it wasn't impossible. Um, they, everybody could have taken their ships all the way around South Africa. And if the crisis had carried on for more than another week or so, there would have been some very big crunch point decisions for shipping companies and for trading companies to have made as to whether or not they gave up on the canal and they took all of their ships uh, in, a, in a vast convoy around, uh, around Africa. Um, so uh, thankfully an issue that didn't actually have to be dealt with in any great detail, but there will, there will be a knock on uh, in terms of legal consequences from either, even that short period of delay on the kind of sale contract side. Can I, I make, 
Can I make one comment again? I don't want to dominate. And it's very interesting. This was a completely irre unrelated to maritime. Yesterday, I did a webinar on COVID-19 and someone mentioned the impact on the insurance industry given the incredible numbers. And we did a, we did a, a presentation and just for France, the losses as a result of the economic losses as a result of COVID-19 over a few weeks was 60 billion euros. The entire premium, the entire premium universe paid to the French market in one year is 600 million euros. So it would require 10 years of premium to cover a few weeks of the losses, which is why um, you know, the states are getting involved. And this, this reminded me of the situation here. We have the market is really being put in jeopardy by these numbers, and um, it's a concern. The, the, the premium, probably five years of premium, won't cover the, the, the claims here for the, for the marine insurance market. And um, I think there needs, there needs to be some thought given to jeopardizing the entire insurance system, given the numbers that are being um, uh, in the press uh, for this. So I just, I just make that comment. And there is a little bit of a relevance there when you think about COVID and the premium versus the cost and, and this incident as well. And perhaps some consideration should be given to that. Sorry, sorry for the diversion, but that was just a view I thought I'd express. No, that, that actually does in a way bring us to what I also wanted to include in this discussion in that, okay, going forward, what would be, um, um, how should we be assessing things? Is there any regulatory reform that we feel should be required? So in a way that does also cover the crisis that the insurance and reinsurance market is seeing due to this ever given. And going back to what Mark said, what I was just quickly gonna say, we did see a couple of the companies that uh, did decide to go with an alternative route and that would have been actually quite, quite interesting uh, to analyze. Um, so I think uh, taking in mind also the time limitation, because this is a discussion that we could be having for hours, I am positive, um, but I would like to get your take um, also in more detail uh, from your individual experiences in this respect, and also some thoughts on going forward and any reforms you would see. We also have some discussions on the size of the vessel, and uh, do we have the structure, the infrastructure in place to be supporting this kind of incidents in the future. So um, let's start maybe from Lena again and take uh, take it around to the table. I would like to discuss about cargo interest side. Mm -hmm. So uh, of course, we have been hearing a lot that uh, uh, cargo on board of vessel uh, is intact, but with every day passing by uh, a refer cargo uh, started deteriorating and um, these importers uh, should be not only preparing to pay uh, insurance uh, contributions to general average fund but also assessing their losses and to see if uh, there are ways for them to reduce their contribution uh, assessing cargo damages. Um, do importers need to panic? No. Vessels, post Panamax vessels as well, have been sailing through Suez for uh, during last decades. And uh, of course, there were uh, casualties, nothing at this scale, um, but importers shouldn't start panicking that it will become uh, usual business practice. Do they have to start uh, insuring every container they ship? Of course not. It depends on a business case, it depends on commodity. So my approach here is very practical. Industry standards for a simple importers shouldn't change, regardless of the volumes, regardless of the business size or countries they are operating. What they can do now, they should prepare operationally. Delays will occur to receive cargo in European ports or United States. You should assess your supply chain, see what the contingencies you can make, gather documents, essential documents to submit uh, to general average adjuster see if a uh, cargo survey will be necessary, but most importantly, don't panic. Better to focus on what next, how to adjust supply chain and, and move forward. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lena, for that. I'm just actually seeing that we've got some questions from the audience, but let's make the round again and we'll uh, conclude with Q&A. Um, um, Harry, would you like to go next? Uh, thanks, Gina. Yes, I, I'd love to. Um, uh, let's do a bit of a thought experiment here, right? Uh, the 900 million has caught everyone's attention. Now, let's break that down. My understanding is the Suez Canal generates $5 billion a year in revenue, right? Uh, so $5 billion a year does not work out to 900 million for six days. Uh, for six days, if you take, you know, I just ran the numbers earlier today. For six days, it works out to about 82 million uh, with, you know, a, another 10% thrown in for moral damages or whatever, you're looking at 90 million. So, you know, but 10% of what the, this number is. Um, assuming that there was a loss of 14 million a day, except... It, that money wasn't lost because only about 20 ships went around the Cape. All the other ships just waited and then paid the paid their Suez Canal dues anyway. So, you know, when we do come, come around to talking about the real numbers, the real numbers will end up at a much lower level because, I, I mean, uh, and let's not forget, we've still got... Uh, the, the Dutch salvers uh, and, and who, who, you know, uh, uh, who actually uh, pulled the ship out um, with the assistance of the Suez Canal tax. So uh, what, once we add all this up, I think the actual numbers will, will look a lot more rational and reasonable. Uh, but coming back to the, the political side, we've got a, a Japanese ship uh, Bernard Schulte Ship Management, we've got a Taiwanese uh, charter, we've got an entirely Indian crew, and let's not forget all four countries are good friends of Egypt, you know, <laughs> uh, and Egypt in turn knows how important the Suez Canal is to the world, and, uh, you know, so uh, once the emotional stuff is dealt with, I think everyone realizes that Egypt needs the canal, the world needs the canal, uh, and everyone's got to be friends. So once we start looking at those numbers, I think we're looking at a very realistic resolution of this case. Um, because, uh, you know, uh, as far as the insurance market is concerned, the marine insurance market is very, very small. Uh, so, uh, you know, as, uh, as Nick and Christopher were saying, uh, the the, the, you know, once you get past the pool, uh, you know, off the p and clubs, you, you then hit the, the reinsurance and that's only about 2 billion. Uh, so, you know, even at a hundred million, this is like 10% of the entire uh, marine insurance market. So, uh, so I think better sense will prevail once everyone starts looking at the real numbers. But, uh, but I think, that will take a bit of time because you, you know you need to get to a point where everyone's talking about real numbers and not just you know I'm angry so I'm going to throw some numbers at. That's definitely a very practical approach, and uh, I mean it, it helps break down the way this uh, claim will be handled. With I think my personal takeaway from Harry's input is that I should have had a political roundtable first on this matter before the legal one. But um, having said that, we've also have a captain that confirms that you can pass through the Suez Canal with no problem in the audience. <laughs> and also on Mark's comment, they um, they have said that actually Evergreen was one of the first companies to divert a vessel, which I, I had not uh, seen. There's some more questions, but we'll take them later. Uh, Christopher, your take? I, I think I've dominated the conversation too much already. I will pass to some of the others who haven't spoken as much. And if there's time, I'll be happy to address the question. Well, feel free to add any comments. This is an open discussion after what- I, 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 I will, but I, a couple of other participants haven't spoken that much, so I will. I will, I will, as they say, I will pass on this. Okay. But I, you can come back to me. Okay, definitely. With the questions, definitely. Um, um, Constantin, do you want to go next? 
Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I want to try and answer uh, a question probably uh, that worries uh, um, most of the people and primarily worries the ship owners. Uh, when will the vessel sail? And uh, to answer this question, I want to first distinct the maritime claims and the limitation fund in London uh, and the um, uh, claims in tort under Egyptian law. And uh, we've mentioned uh, before in the discussion that uh, the club uh, did not provide a timely and a letter of undertaking. Well, maybe the club, uh, well, certainly the club uh, offered a letter of undertaking, but why must the Suez Canal Authority or the Egyptian authorities accept uh, a piece of paper, uh, well, a reputable piece of paper? Uh, they might simply say, no, we will keep, keep the vessel as security and read that as a hostage. And uh, the claims that uh, the Egyptians, uh, the Egyptian authorities have, they're subject to local uh, uh, tort law. So uh, I think there will be a big bargain in terms of the compensation uh, to be paid to the Egyptian authorities. The Egyptian authorities can get a local court judgment. And as the issue is political, the courts will probably be very protective and they can get a judgment for, from the local courts for 900 million or 500 million or whatever amount uh, they will uh, put in their claim as a reputational damage and uh, salvage and damage to the canal and so on. But how do they enforce this judgment? Well, they have the vessel. The vessel with the cargo is estimated at least at 500 million, but they cannot enforce it against uh, the cargo. They can only enforce it against the vessel. How? Well, they can uh, judicially sell the vessel in Egypt. Will there be a buyer uh, uh, buying this vessel for say 100 million at an auction? Well, the answer is no. Uh, nobody would want to buy that vessel with, with all those problems. And then what can the Egyptian authority do? Uh, uh, the Egyptian authority can uh, ask to, to the ship owners and their liability underwriters to pay uh, the sum judge. And then it will be probably a matter of uh, lengthy negotiations until uh, uh, a discount is given to an acceptable amount for the for the PNI clubs to 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 pay, and the vessel uh, would sail. Uh, this is based on on uh, ex experience in Russia, where we had. Um, uh, claims for $60 million from port authorities for uh, damages to, to an oil berth. And basically, we tried to set up a limitation fund, and the limitation was broken. It's, it's very difficult to break limitation under Article 4 of the convention, but limitation was broken simply on the argument that the master of the vessel, uh, uh, the vessel was going with uh, an excessive speed, and that's a bar to limitation, which, which is actually completely wrong. But uh, uh, local courts are usually, well, at least in Russia, they're very protective towards government authorities and, and major uh, local companies. So I think the vessel uh, will sail only when, when a settlement will be reached with, uh, uh, with uh, Egyptian authorities, uh, which, which does not really involve a lot of uh, legal issues. Uh, and I don't believe that uh, the ship owners can succeed against the uh, Egyptian authorities in Egyptian court. Uh, and th the rest of the claims are, are maritime claims. Yes, we have the limitation fund in, in London. And then uh, a general average, uh, um, we, uh, the estimate is the vessel is worth, say, 100 million, and the cargo worth, worth say 400, 500 million or more. So a, a major part of uh, the salvage costs uh, will uh, have to be compensated by uh, the cargo interests, the cargo underwriters. Uh, and uh, that, that's, that's like a purely mar maritime law issue. But uh, the, the question when the vessel is, is, will sail is, is the most intriguing and how much uh, uh, the clubs or the owners will have to pay for the vessel to sail. It's, it's more uh, of a hostage-like situation and uh, negotiations for releasing the hostage uh, rather than uh, a maritime law dispute, especially if we're talking about the claims in tort under Egyptian law. If I, if I could just address that, I, I don't, I, I think that if there was not a settlement, they could certainly, they wouldn't be able to arrest a sister vessel, but they could attach property 
of the owner. So assuming the owner uh, or, or the charterer, the owner has other vessels, and apparently he does, uh, they, could, they, could, they could block them. They could, as soon as a sister vessel entered Egyptian waters, they could attach the property if they still had an open. Um, that, yeah, so that, unless, it's a single ship company, Christopher. Uh, company, but, it's in Panama, and uh, you would have to break the corporate veil. And, um, yeah, but that, so that is another question. I mean, well, we're, we're, we're in Egypt. What can yeah. I <laughs> well, well, yes, correct. So, and Egypt, it follows the Napoleonic Code. Napoleonic Code has got different views as far as uh, sister ships are concerned. And of course, we are also as Christopher says in in Egypt. Um, uh, uh, the structure, as far as I can see, is that uh, 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 the group owner has got uh, uh, single vessel companies for every single ship. So, uh, Luster, the registered owner is Luster Maritime. Uh, um, but you know uh, the Japanese group owner has come forward saying I'm the owner. Uh, if this was in South Africa, um, that would be enough to to arrest sister ships. Um, uh, 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 as far as the GA is concerned, yeah, you know it, 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 this of course then shifts the whole aspect the other way around. Uh, uh, um, the ship owner now will be making a claim for GA contributions. And as, as uh, Constantine rightly points out, because the value of the cargo is at least three to four times. I, I heard $7 billion. Um, again, you know, in the, this is Lloyd's List reported. Uh, uh, um, so, you know, between 7 billion to 500 million to half a billion, whatever. <laughs> so easy to roll these numbers off. Uh, uh, it, it's far exceeds the value of the ship. So they will be the you know, vast majority. And then the question is whether or not there's an exception to uh, the uh, or defense uh, a rule a rule um, rule rule F, I think <laughs> I said G A S S. Everybody is is, is a it's a mystery to most people. Anyway, uh, this the unseaworthiness uh, defense. Uh, there's no indication at all uh, 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 that there was anything unseaworthy about the vessel. Although there was there was you know. Uh, speculation as to whether or not there was loss of uh, steerage, uh, 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 which 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 caused her to 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 shift so quickly, um, but all that's speculation, and all that's very, very far into the future. I suppose the immediate problem, given that she's going to be hostage for a long time, is to then try and transship the cargo. But that operation must twenty thousand boxes in the middle of nowhere. I don't know how they're going to do that. Um, operationally, must be very expensive to do. Definitely. Actually, we had a comment okay. had on the discussion uh -huh. uh, about abandonment of cargo, but I'd like to come to the comments at the end, and I'll let uh, Lorenzo and Mark to add their input before we go into audience questions and concluding uh, comments. Lorenzo? Yeah. yeah, yeah, Gina. I would like to... Is which a little bit the focus from this ship? Let's try to do this exercise. The, from this ship, they were given to the other vessels, and something that, that uh, we are experienced uh, nowadays and came to our desk you know, uh, in, in these days is the potential charter party uh, dispute. Uh, charters are coming. Well, uh, uh, Lorenzo, uh, the owner didn't arrive within the lay candidate. Uh, can I cancel the contract? Yes. Can I claim damage? Uh, but he didn't proceed with the utmost dispatch. Okay, so let, I see a lot of confusion in, in this regard. And uh, I, I would like to give a legal uh, framework briefly, um, especially uh, for a Boya Charter Party the, and under English law. Um, so in this specific case, under a Boya Charter Party, all the extra cost, the additional time, the extra cost incurred by the vessel will be borne uh, by the owner. And this is quite straightforward. Uh, another straightforward aspect is that uh, the charter will be entitled to cancel the charter, the charter party, if the kind is, is not met due to the blockage. However, um, this doesn't mean uh, I mean, the fact that the owner doesn't arrive within the cancellation due date doesn't automatically give rise to a right to claim damage against the owner. This is a very important concept under English law, uh, the distinction between 
cancellation clause and breach of contract. Uh, under English law, owners uh, do not have an absolute duty to arrive on time. Uh, just if they don't to arrive, the, ch the charter can cancel. However, they do have, owners have a very uh, obligation. There is an implied condition of, under English law that the owner commence the approach voyage on time. So when it's reasonably certain that the vessel uh, will arrive at the port of loading by the cancelling date. So this is what the charter has to look at. If, whether or not the charter started the approach voyage. And then if it didn't, then it can claim damage. It can claim the termination of the charter party and claim damage uh, for it. Uh, and finally, there is another implying condition. Uh, once you know, he, uh, the approach voyage is commenced, then the, the owner has to proceed with the utmost dispatch. Now, it doesn't seem to me uh, that the blockage and the delay uh, due to the uh, Suez Canal blockage uh, can amount to a, a, a breach of, of this term. So uh, that was, sorry for the technicalities. <laughs> No, I mean, that's what we're here for, to break the <laughs> aspects down and hear your right, uh, different pro uh, perspectives. Uh, because I, I saw there are, um, especially with, uh, within, who is not familiar with charter party dispute yeah. and, and uh, English law, there is a lot of, you know, uh, the LA can is the, <laughs> is the date where I can do or I cannot do whatever I want. So uh, I think uh, uh, English law drawn a clear distinction on this and uh, it's uh, of utmost importance to, because we are expecting many uh, disputes, many claims for a breach of charter party. Definitely. And uh, Mark, your take on that? Um, I, I think we've covered quite a few things quite well. Um, I, I thought the um, Egyptian courts got a bit of a rough ride from everybody else on the panel, whether, whether fairly or unfairly, and they certainly have their issues. But uh, I thought one thing that we haven't discussed, which I think uh, for, for the panel and everybody listening would be interesting to have a quick chat about, is that, that obviously by going through the canal, you undertake to um, follow the rules of navigation of the canal. Uh, and as you can imagine, they're pretty extensive in terms of the exclusions of liability, not just for the Suez Canal Authority, but also but they, they provide the pilotage for the vessel when it's going through the canal. Uh, so technically, the, um, uh, the pilots of the Canal Authority were uh, taking the vessel through the canal itself, but that's all excluded. So everything remains with the owner themselves. Um, so if there are proceedings, which there highly are likely to be in the Egyptian courts, uh, it's not a case necessarily the Egyptian courts not being particularly good, but it's a fact that the ship owners have um, exclu excluded the canal's uh, liability quite significantly through the sheer use of the canal itself. So uh, whilst it might be a, an easy thing to bash bash the canal authority, uh, contractually they're probably in, in a very strong position to, through the basis of the rules that themselves uh, and as we've also briefly covered then then there's also a fairly broad approach to the um the, the damages that are recoverable in tort as a matter of um civil law um so so it won't be surprising if a, a very significant judgment is obtained and it's not necessarily a, a political thing it may well be just the the application of the the legal position under egyptian law yeah, interesting. It would have definitely also had been uh, quite enlightening to have an Egyptian lawyer with us, but as I mentioned before we started, it proved quite challenging at this stage. Um, thank you very much for that uh, input, Mark, and everybody. Uh, as we're approaching our unfortunate closing of this discussion, because we are already running over time, but I would like to hear some final comments and just read um, some input, I guess, from the audience. One of the things they said is here, I mentioned to the CTL of the vessel and abandonment of cargo. It's addressed to Nick. I think he's kind of touched on it, but any uh, further comments would be more than welcomed. And uh, we've also got here an interesting rather question, I would say, on... Uh, how the owners and charters in the future might um, consider this uh, cost or, or create some kind of a fear or, res or reluctancy in going through the canal. I think that's more a bit more technical and commercial, but from a legal perspective, it would be good to know is there anything they can do to mitigate 
uh, the risks uh, this, of this kind of incidents going forward. So let's make a final round with some brief uh, comments and concluding remarks uh, from everybody. Um, Christopher, would you like to go first since you passed the previous uh, round? Sure, of course, thank you. I, I, and to get back to Hari's point about the numbers, I, I go back to my view that there's two levels to this and I think the political level is driving the numbers. Um, and again, I'm not an Egyptian lawyer. I have no idea what the rules are, but I do agree that there's gross exaggeration. And I do think, and with all due respect to the Egyptian government, they have to keep in mind that the insurance market, if there's no insurance market, there'll be no traffic through the canal and there'll be no traffic. And you know, the, the, the system could collapse if, if, it's, if it's overwhelmed by grossly exaggerated claims. And I go back to the COVID idea where we've got 60 million, 60 billion euros of losses, total premium for the year in France is 600 million. This is beginning to sound a little bit like the same thing. So I do think that the government should take into consideration and with all due respect that you don't want to basically torpedo jeopardize the entire market and the system for political reasons. Um, uh, so that's my general view. I think people have to be a little more measured and think about the long-term impact of grossly exaggerated, crazy claims for that are being asserted for political reasons versus uh, making sure that the system as it exists continues, that vessels can continue to get cover, p &I clubs can remain solvent. And you know, the alternative, I guess, is everybody goes around the, goes around the horn, doesn't use the the Suez Canal and those revenues would be that are lost would be much more significant than than what's been lost in this situation. I think the point was made. The vessels did end up going through, so the lost revenue uh, claim to me seems rather exaggerated. That's just my view because they are going through and they are paying their dues. So I think the government should take a little more of a long term perspective um, so that the markets can continue and the shipping industry can continue with insurance. That's just my general view. Definitely well noted. Uh, Nick, you're, you're on mute. Uh, yeah, my bad. Yeah, no, the numbers, the numbers are, are so big, mm -hmm. um, they would have to climb down 90%. Even if they climb down 90%, it's still 100 million. And 100 million is close to the value of the vessel. So the numbers we are talking about are staggering. Um, and one hopes that you know, everybody sees sense. Uh, uh, um, and that's, that's, all, that's all we can do is just live in hope in that respect. Um, uh, um, as far as, as, far as the, looking at the GA side of things are concerned, uh, a thought suddenly occurred to me, but you know, again, it needs to study, I suppose, whether or not any settlement made with uh, the ship owner uh, would be a an average expenditure. But because if 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 it was necessary to save the voyage, yeah, uh, in order to release the ship, to pay this money to the the Swiss Canal authorities, whether that is a a, 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 an allowable average ex expenditure. And if so, then uh, um, the cargo owners may end up having to pay the vast majority of that. So, so uh, I don't know, question mark, question mark. Well, we definitely, I think, I think seeing a lot of question marks going forward until this uh, is uh, uh, untangled, this case is untangled. Um, Lena, would you like to go next? Yes, I would like to share a final uh, two thoughts. Mm -hmm. First um, is that um, we expect in particular volume clients, in particular from United uh, States, try to exclude from general average contributions uh, in their future service contracts. So this will also uh, change uh, uh, entire regulation around this old uh, concept because uh, these volume uh, clients put a lot of pressure on, um, on the shipping lines. And my second uh, thought is um, about loss prevention. We have been uh, discussing a lot today um, about exposure, which um, vessel owner 
faces today and cargo owners as well, but we still are not aware uh, of the cause, why the incident happened. And um, Egyptian authorities uh, uh, should come up with their investigations. The final investigations uh, will have to wait for um, much longer, but um, this will definitely affect uh, the legal implications. And uh, vessel and sea warfareness is, uh, is still considered. So that was all from my side. Definitely. We've still got comments coming in like the cargo that wasn't insured, but I think that would open just another <laughs> stream of discussion. So maybe we should do a part two on this. Uh, Mark? Uh, yes, I mean, I, I think you're probably going to be finding a new uh, Suez Canal clause cropping up in time charter parties and voyage charter parties quite soon. Um, I, I think when I was doing a bit of research on this earlier, that there is actually a, a BIMCO clause for um, canal blockages, which I have never ever seen in a time charter party or a voyage charter party. Uh, I think it's meant for time charter parties and it was back from 1968. Um, so I think I think back in the day there was a, a very lengthy uh, disuse of the Suez Canal due to I think following obviously the Suez Crisis and I think there was another major um, uh, time when the uh, Egyptian government closed the canal. Um, so uh, I wouldn't be surprised if maybe the old BIMCO clause is resurrected. Uh, essentially, that that permits uh, if if a blockage is going to happen um, before loading, then owners can require a different route. Uh, the charterers can nominate if, it, if it's expected that the blockage will last a certain period, uh, which you have to insert in the charter party itself. Um, so, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if people uh, start digging around and in, in the trade between East and West start, um, start putting those kind of clauses back in to uh, make sure that the situation is relatively clear. Because as, as I said earlier, the kind of average, the standard concepts like force majeure struggle to um, apply in these cases. Uh, and the, um, uh, the, the, the other concepts such as off hire and stuff like that tend to fall on the side that they, they, they don't fall within those clauses. Um, so yeah, I, I, would, I would imagine people will be dusting off their charter parties and having a bit of a bit of a think about things going forward. Just when everybody thought that after COVID with the force majeure clause elab elaborating on that would be uh, <laughs> providing full coverage, something you just came along. So definitely that's uh, something I believe, I, I, I agree we will be seeing. Um, Constantine, Lorenzo, and then Harry. And uh, yes, uh, I'd like to raise a point uh, that was picked up by the Russian media and uh, Russian authorities uh, at time of the incident. Everyone said, well, look, there is an alternative route. It's the Northern Sea route. It's 30% uh, shorter from Shanghai to, to Hamburg. Uh, and uh, from Yokohama to, to Hamburg, it's more than 50% shorter. And that's the alternative route. So faster, shorter, cheaper, and so on. But it, it would require a nuclear icebreaker assistance. Uh, but nevertheless, this was something that was on the media for days and with, with various um, people commenting uh, on the uh, uh, advantages of the Northern Sea Route. Well, it, it's, it's, it's an option uh, really very limited for perhaps tankers, but not for container vessels. Um, and well, there, there is a lot of investment uh, in Russia uh, to the infrastructure of the Northern Sea Route. But I mean, there are no ports along the way. It's, it's just uh, from point A to point B. Uh, it's not something that uh, would be useful for containers, but it, it is an alternative option for say, um, oil tankers. Yeah. That's my short short comment. Uh, uh, Non-legal non comment. Containing. Yes, definitely. Very interesting perspective of how the media that have no idea about shipping portray things. Um, uh, Lorenzo. Yeah, uh, my final comment. Uh, Italian media. Uh, every time it's happened when there's a casualty, casualties, uh, it's the fault is, is of the, it's called maritime giantism. Okay, the, the size of the ships. Uh, stop building ships of that size. Well, um, then I also have heard that every vessel uh, running to, passing to Suez Canal should be escorted by tugs. Uh, anyway, we, I heard a lot of things. Um, what this casualty, uh, I said at the beginning, um, 
could teach us is uh, could could give rise awareness. Uh, awareness and not give up and continue to uh, do a lot of prevention, implementing uh, safety measures for, uh, uh, for, for, for the sheep, for the seaworthiness of the sheep. So uh, we hope that this is uh, an occasion to continue in this, uh, in this route. Definitely. Thank you, Lorenzo. And uh, Harry? Last but not least, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just uh, a couple of thoughts. Uh, what one? Uh, I, I in in my previous life uh, in in the large city firms, I have dealt with other incidents of vessels getting grounded in the Suez Canal or or in the Red Sea after exiting the uh, Suez Canal. The Suez Canal Authority has historically been very sensible. Uh, so so when when they threw out this nine hundred million dollar claim. It came as a surprise to a lot of people. Um, <clears throat> so um, what I expect is once the emotions die down, they will realize that the effect of this is going to be increased premiums. Uh, it's going to drive up shipping costs for everyone. And the Suez Canal will not necessarily benefit. It's going to be because ultimately, I mean, uh, what the U.S. dollar is to the global economy, the Suez Canal is to the shipping industry. You know, you need the Suez Canal to be inexpensive and, and cost effective. So well, once that conversation starts, I think, uh, you know, there will be a sensible resolution. And a lot of these anticipated horror stories about, you know, what what we may need to do to deal with, uh, you know, these Suez issues, I think those will go away uh, because, you know, uh, if there is a, an early resolution, you know, I mean, again, it's, it's, it's only been two weeks. Um, the other uh, issue then is, <clears throat> and, and uh, pardon me, no, no disrespect meant to anyone, uh, just having lived in the Middle East for a very long time. Uh, I don't know if any of you has ever bought a carpet in a Middle Eastern souk. You go there, the guy goes, $1,000. You say, no, $5. You, know, you walk away. There's this whole dance. Eventually, you get to a price where everyone's happy, right? And I believe that there's a bit of that going on. And, you know, again, we, this is literally two weeks after, uh, you know, um, after the vessel was refloated. Um the, the thing to remember is this ship sitting there in that lake is of no use to anybody. Uh, if, if the uh, Suez Canal Authority is not prepared to accept, you know, the limitation numbers, ship sits there, what good is it? You know, there are no cranes there, no gantry cranes of any size, let alone the size required to uh, offload 20,000 containers off this giant ship. Uh, and and if they, uh, I mean, again, a horror story. If they confiscate this ship, expropriate it, uh, that who's going to insure that ship? And who's going to insure? You know, I mean, the global insurance industry is going to be on the other side of this. So, I think uh, if you if you think through all these issues, uh, you know, I mean, not not necessarily from a political perspective, but just in terms of the economics that go into all of this, uh, somebody somewhere is gonna be like, all right, you know what? Uh, we need to be the good old sensible Suez Canal Authority that we're known to be, and let's do a deal and let's get back to business.